Welcome back to today's discussion on diversity and inclusion. Our, our next GLVC rep representative is Dr. Nancy Workman, and she is going to share with us uh, her perspective in terms of, on how bias uh, creeps into and impacts the, the hiring uh, practices. Um, I'm going to tell three stories. The first two have nothing directly to do with athletics, but I'll bring the third uh, into the, uh, the conversation. So before I was FIR, I was chair of a department, and one August, very late in the term, um, someone uh, resigned from a position, so I, so I had to do some last minute hiring. So I called HR and I asked them for the list of names. Uh, typically we have individuals who uh, send out resumes. I, I interviewed people over the phone and invite a few people uh, to campus for one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations. One day as I was in my office, a gentleman entered my room, in my room and he identified himself as a candidate. Immediately, I was struck by the fact that he was visually impaired. He was legally blind. Uh, that had never come, come up into our conversation, and it was very surprising to me that he had applied for a position to teach composition. I was very frustrated uh, uh, at that moment because I didn't know exactly how to behave, but I thought I had to go through the interview because it would have been very discriminatory not to do so. So in the course of our conversation, I asked him the typical questions you ask of a candidate, but I also asked him more specific questions about how he had to have accommodations in order to perform the job of being an English instructor, because so much of what we do is grading student work. And it turns out he explained rather carefully that he participated in, in a service and that the service read students' papers aloud to him. He gave oral recitations and was able to score them in the typical way that a typical instructor would. And as the conversation went on, I began to become very self-aware of my own uh, biases about what I had in terms of expectations. Never occurred to me for, for one minute that someone with a very severe uh, visual impairment could do a job uh, that I assumed you had to be uh, fully uh, uh, sighted to do. So I took a, took a chance, I called HR and I asked if I could hire him. And the other apprehension I had was about my students. I thought, well, if they walk into a section and he's their inst instructor, you know, how are the students gonna react? I mean, typically when the school year starts, those of us who are chairs, we, we have a bunch of students who enter our room, they wanna change a section because they don't like, like a teacher, you know, that's pretty commonplace. So I thought, well, what's going to happen to my own students when, or the students at Lewis, they have a blind instructor who has never, uh, you, know, you know, they've never had that kind of interaction. So HR gave me the go-ahead to hire him. I did. And it turns out that in the six years that Brian worked for us, never once was there a student complaint against his performance. I sat in on his classes. I observed his teaching. Uh, he used humor as a kind of deflection, but he was a very capable individual. And he left our institution to pursue a graduate degree in another field altogether. Uh, but it was an interesting, interesting thing uh, for me to self-reflect as an educator about how we, no matter how well-intentioned, bring bias to our own interaction. The second, second story involves a situation with a student. Um, before I was hired at Lewis, I taught two years at Northern Illinois. And I had a student who was visually impaired. She sat right in front of my, my desk and she would take uh, notes for the class and she had a machine that converted her notes into braille. So she would read the notes, she would read braille. Well, she stopped coming to class, she wasn't turning in her assignments and it became pretty obvious that I was gonna have to fail her. But I had real misgivings about that because uh, uh, I thought, how does one do that? How do you fail a student who is blind in your class? Like, what kind of message am I sending? And I know that may sound kind of, odd, kind of odd, but I called up the counseling center and I said, you know, this is the situation. I have a student who is really not doing the work. And they said to me that, well, your obligation is to give her the grade that's fair. And in this case, if that's a failing grade, that's the grade she deserves. So I recorded the F as, as her final uh, uh, term grade. But again, I had incredible misgivings about injustice and what does it mean and what does it mean to make accommodations. So the third st story uh, really brings this all to mind. And I should mention that I always teach classes. I teach advanced classes in um, literature. 
And the big issue we struggle with, with is identity formation and identity and privilege. Uh, we look at uh, characters in novels, for example, in terms of who has privilege and who does not. And so the whole issue of disability studies has become a predominant theme within my discipline. I'm not very well informed in it, so I guess I have a lot of questions about, about accommodations, what does that mean? Um, and when it comes to sports, last year I was able to attend the inclusion forum where I saw a demonstration of a Paralympic sport involving uh, vision impaired uh, athletes. And it was very amazing to me the performance level uh, of these student athletes. Uh, they, in fact, were on their way to Rio. They were competing. Uh, we saw a kind of abbreviated version of the sport that was going to be held at the Paralympics. What it brought to mind, as did a lot of the conversations, about the notion of access in education. So as an educator, I guess one of the things I'm interested in is, is who gets to play hmm. and what kind of disabilities can we make accommodations for? Do we do that at an individual institutional level or do we do it at a con conference level? Right now, of course, there's a lot at stake. Students get scholarships for being able-bodied. Uh, they perform and they get uh, uh, significant di discounts on their education. And that is not always available to people with disability. So these experiences have kind of led me to a lot of questions. Since I certainly don't have the answers to them, uh, but it's really sensitized them to my own biases as an educator. Okay. Thank you. Um, so in terms of that bias, um, maybe what proactive steps have you taken to, to really reflect and, and determine what other biases may I bring to the table and, and how does that impact my decision making? Well, I guess as an educator, the first thing you do is to educate yourself. Mm -hmm. So I went online, for example, in terms of the Paralympics, and I noticed that there are quite a number of organizations that are specifically devoted to blind student athletes. Uh, and it's incredible the number of sports that, that uh, people participate in, things like bowling and rolling and, and track and field. To the best of my knowledge, I've never seen um, a student with uh, severe visu visual impairment participate in these. So again, that raises the question of, well, what does that mean? So I guess you begin the conversations mm -hmm. uh, with the understanding that people who are experts are gonna, are gonna have more to say. Um, I don't feel that I have I've raised the issues in my own classrooms, though, with my own students. Um, I teach student teachers, but I've also raised them in terms of disability studies. You know, what does it mean when we encounter a character in a short story? Uh, because that's what I teach. Uh, but in terms of athletes, it's really, really made me very aware of how much we privilege um, the elite athlete who is able-bodied. Um, and they don't even get press. For example, the Paralympics have been in Rio for the last several weeks. And if you look at the number of news articles on that particular um, uh, event, it's minimal in, in comparison to the kind mm -hmm. of coverage uh, that um, um, were given to the regular Olympians. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you spoke to your experience at the Inclusion Forum. Yes. Um, in terms of, terms of uh, what you learned and what you took away, how has that impacted your ability to be FAR uh, at your institution? Well, it's a conversation that uh, I intend to raise at Lewis and some members of my uh, uh, colleagues are here um, just to kind of raise the issue um, you know what does it mean to be um, a, we're a school for example that fosters um, first-generation college mm. students to have access and so the question is how are we defining that you know are we too narrowly really defining it and in terms of sports uh, what kind of opportunities are we providing students to participate who have any num number of disabilities, vision impairment being just one of perhaps many? All right. Well, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, personal experience and, 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 and knowledge, uh, and uh, we appreciate it.